Uh, You are going to need your Bibles. Uh, We are in the Old Testament book, Haggai. So if you don't know where that tiny little book is, just two chapters right near the end of the Old Testament. If you get to Matthew, Mark, Luke, the New Testament, you've gone a little too far, just go back a few pages. Tiny little book, Haggai, we're going to be in chapter one. So if you've been around, uh, you will know that we are in a topical series of messages. We're taking nine weeks to focus in on the theme of renewal and revival and rebuilding. And we've grabbed the the post-exilic books in the Old Testament, this time of rebuilding of the nation and looking for themes, very practical themes of how they apply to our life and our day as we look at our own nation and our own lives and ask the Lord, could you bring renewal and revival in our day? So that's what we're on about. Uh, Much has been written on the topic of revival. Uh, Early on in the series, I mentioned an article uh, by Tim Keller who said in studying uh, revivals that there are four stages that you can see both biblically and historically in revival, and they are these that sleepy Christians First, wake up. God begins with his own people. Nominal Christians get saved. The lost start being found. And then ultimately, we see city or regional or national transformation in some instances where revival has broken out. And we mentioned that early on, and I've come back to it a couple times throughout the series because I want to remind you these things because when I hear people talking about revival today, I often hear them talking about stage number four. Uh, They want to get to the transformation part. They want to see the city change, the region change, the nation change, but might forget that God always begins with his people. And so sort of the theme verse for the whole series, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people pray, that God always begins first with his own people. And so just to remind ourselves of that, that God always be, begins with us. And, and so I've tried to emphasize that. Uh, so secondly, when I hear people talking about revival, I, I sometimes hear them talking about what we might call revivalism put an ISM on the end of it, that there's a formula somehow to revival. If we can just do X, Y, Z, whatever it might be, uh, then the revival will have to happen. Or that there are certain events that if you haven't seen these effects, then it's not really truly revival. And and again, to quote from Tim Keller, uh, just two months before he passed, he wrote another article, a little blog post on revival, and he said that there are two caricatures of revival that are common in the evangelical world today. The one he called frontier revival and the second charismatic revivalism. And he went on to define these two in the frontier revivals of the olden days that if you just do enough hard work, if you knock on every door in town, if you get all the churches together, you pray and you just put a date on the calendar so the revival's gonna be September 21st to 26th, y'all come. And somehow thinking that what we do would fan into flame revival fire. So on the other extreme would be people who say, if there hasn't been a certain manifestation of the spirit, if we hadn't, haven't seen a certain level of emotion or fervor or some particular expressions of the Holy Spirit, then it's not truly revival, and they call it revivalism. You've got to see these effects. And Keller's response is this, revival isn't something human beings do nor simply the extraordinary apparition of the Holy Spirit. Real revival is the intensification, now look at this phrase, of the ordinary operations of the Holy Spirit. That's significant. Revival is the intensification of the ordinary operations of the Spirit. And what are those operations of the Spirit? The ordinary operations of the Spirit are conviction, conversion, assurance, and sanctification. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, convicting us, Converting us, assuring us, sanctifying us. And when those operations are intensified across a church, denomination, city, or country, you've got revival. And then he went on to say this, revival is the restoring of the ordinary rhythms. And the reason we see these things as extraordinary is that we have slipped so far into complacency. He says the reasons why we think these things are revival is they're just the ordinary workings of the Spirit. But our religion has become so meh that when the Holy Spirit actually starts doing just the basic things the Holy Spirit has always done, we're we're like, revival is broken out. And you're like, no, the Spirit's just doing what the Spirit has always done. And so as we're looking at this 100-year chunk of history, welcome here, Rick, glad you can come. (laughs) We're not looking so much for some mysterious key or secret sauce or the silver bullet that will guarantee revival, but we're rather looking at the very practical outworkings. And and we've used this little phrase again and again over the weeks that when God sets to renew his people, he then does something. And we talked about the fact that he uses gospel partnerships, patrons. It's not just preaching and praying. That's always there. 
but he uses the partnerships, that God puts Christ in center back to the center of our lives, worship in the word, back to the basics, that it's always in all hands on deck, that you see 100% engagement, volunteerism and service and, and action. People get excited and they get on board. And then last weekend that when God sets to renew his people, he sets to renew our families. And we talked about marriage and sexuality and our identity in Christ. And this week, as we look at this phrase, when God sets to renew his people, he sets his eyes on the relationship that we have with money, wealth, generosity, fear, and greed. Now, as I was prepping this week, I was very well aware of the fact that while last weekend's message was a little bit pointed, for the most part, I have found that Christians are quite interested in the topic of sex and sexuality. However, many get nervous when they hear the sermon's going to be about money. In fact, right now, you might be wishing, dang, I wish I hadn't shown up tonight. And why is that true? What is it about this particular topic that causes us to get uncomfortable? Because as we look at this 100-year period, what we're going to see is that when God sets to renew his people, he resets their financial priorities. It's all over this story. So we're going to divide it into four parts. We're going to do a historical review, a quick fly over the text. We're going to do a deeper dive into the book of Haggai, chapter 1. We're going to go back to a 30,000-foot view, looking at some biblical principles, and then finally tie it up with some boots on the ground, some counterintuitive kingdom responses to these things. So really quickly, just a historical flyover, if you will, this 100-year period of time, realizing that money is talked about in every book of the Bible, and it's the same in this period of time. So it starts with Cyrus, the king, making a decree that you can go back and rebuild Jerusalem. And very interesting that it was a partnership. The funding came from the free will offerings of the people, but also from the government. That's very interesting. Ezra 1, let each survivor in whatever place he sojourns be assisted by the men of his place with silver and gold, with goods and beasts, besides free will offerings for the house of God that's in Jerusalem. So you can go back home, but as you're leaving, talk to all your friends and neighbors and take an offering to take with you. Let the people of God contribute to the building of God's house. That's a very common way of fundraising for God's work. But then we look at what Cyrus thought about his own responsibility. Chapter 1, verse 2, thus says Cyrus, the Lord, the God of heaven, has charged me, this political leader, this guy who, as far as we know, did not bend his knee to Yahweh. He has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem. And then chapter 3, it says, and they gave money to the masons and the carpenters and food and drink and oil according to the grant that they had from Cyrus. So here's a little question, not our topic, but for another day, should the church and state partner? I'll just drop that out there and we'll move right on. <laughs> Fast forward 60 years later. Nehemiah, chapters 9 and 10, and we might call it the WWW reforms. Work, wealth, and women. It follows the dedication of the wall and this great day of preaching by Ezra. And the, when he said to them, you know, you're going to have a party on the temple grounds. It's a potluck, the joy of the Lord's your strength. Stop weeping right now. And then it's followed by Repentance. And a renewal of the covenant, and there's these three areas. The renewing the covenant because you've not honored God by taking a Sabbath. You're not trusting him that you can work six days and God will look after the seventh. They were not honoring him in their work. They were not honoring him in their wealth. They were not honoring him in tithes and offerings. And they weren't honoring him, last weekend's message, in their relationships with the women from the culture around them. So work, wealth, and women, they're all there in that text. And then finally, if you fast forward to the end of the 100-year period, in fact, add just a little bit on to Malachi's report card near the end. So probably another 30 years after, and what we read in the last book of the Bible, that these reforms that we are studying actually didn't stick. The financial faithlessness of God's people comes up yet again. And Malachi says to them over and again, instead of giving God your first and your best, you're giving him the leftovers. 
You're giving him the lame and the wounded and the sick from your flocks instead of the lambs without spot and blemish and the leftovers from your harvest. Instead of the first fruits of your harvest, you're not bringing in the grain and the wine and the oil. You're just giving him the gleanings at the end of the month. You're robbing God of his tithe and you wonder why you're in financial trouble. So that's the flyover. 100 years from the very beginning right to the very end, money comes up all the way through it. But when you get down on the ground in Haggai chapter 1, what we see and hear from this particular preacher is that the people are getting a swift kick in the seat. He is not a politically correct preacher. He simply tells it like he sees it, and he basically says to these people, you know what? You're in the financial mess you're in because you're not honoring the Lord. Now, that's pretty straightforward teaching. I don't know if the people were ticked off. It doesn't tell us in the text. But Haggai starts basically with some questions. And the first question is, when is the right time for you to be generous? Basically, when's the right time to be generous? So Haggai chapter 1, the first two verses. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai to the prophet Zerubbabel and to Joshua the high priest. Verse 2. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Okay, now the dating is important. In the first year of Darius, so we go back into the history books and we realize since Cyrus gave the decree, 16 years have now come and gone. Because Cyrus reigns for like another 10 years, he dies. His son Cambius reigns for eight or nine years, he dies. Darius takes over. So we are 16 years into this story at this point, and the people are saying, ah, the time's not yet right for us to be doing this. And Haggai basically just gets up in their grill and is like, so when is the right time? If now is not the right time, when is it? And then he says, you know what? The Lord has some words of rebuke for you, verse three and four. The word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house, the house of the Lord, lies in ruins? The Lord's got something to say. You've completed your own homes while mine is still in rubble. And there's an illusion here that these people might have remembered, and we should remember, that when this very same temple, Solomon's temple, was first built, Solomon went at it in this particular order. He first built the house of the Lord, and then he worked on his own house. So 1 Kings 6, so Solomon built the house, the temple, and finished it. And he lined the walls of the house on the inside with boards of cedar. From the floor of the house to the walls of the ceiling, he covered them on the inside with wood. And then you go one chapter further forward, 1 Kings 7, and then he builds his own house. So the order was important. The paneled house comment, that's interesting. Commentators say it can be taken in two ways. It is sometimes used to refer to the ceiling or the roof. So in other words, if you're in a paneled house, the roof is on, you have finished your house, but my house isn't yet finished. That's one way of taking it. And the other way of taking it is just simply that it refers to the paneling on the walls of the house, uh, uh, like what we read there from Solomon building the first temple. Now, the truth is that most homes were simply built out of stone and some sort of a mortar, like mud, rock. That's what was available. There was very little wood, and what wood was there was very expensive. The cedar trees of Lebanon, the king's forest, quote-unquote, was very famous, but that wood was also very expensive. And so if you lived in a house with wood paneling, your home, you had really splurged. So now you're living in your paneled houses while my house is still in ruins. And the challenge is pretty straightforward. You're preoccupied with your own comfort while the work of God is in great need. And then he gets up in their grill with some specific questions. Have you thought about your life? Verse five, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them in a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Consider your ways. That word consider is used five times in this book, and commentators tell us it is a very strong word. 
It's not just pause for a moment, but it is stop and think deeply. Do a sober self-analysis of your economic health. Like go through your bank statements, go through your your financial health and look at it and consider what you said earlier that now it's not the right time. You can't afford to give. There's no extra at the end of the month. The economic times are hard. There's political uncertainty is what the people could have been saying because that is the historical moment. Cyrus has passed, his son Cambius follows. Cambius dies under mysterious circumstances, is all we're told. There's very little in the history books, but he dies young and he dies mysteriously and then Darius takes over and there's political unrest. Egypt now rebels and they start rattling their sabers. So there is war right on the border of Israel and inflation goes up. The economic times are challenging. And so the people, no wonder they're saying, you know what? There's political unrest. There's inflation in the land. Now is not the time for me to be giving away my resources. And yet God says, but think about your life. You plant and you harvest little. You eat and drink, but you're never satisfied. You put on clothes, but you're not warm. You put wages in a a bag with holes in it. Your finances seem to leak away like a bucket with holes in it. So just stop for a moment and think about your ways. Five times, consider it, consider it, consider it. There's more going on here than just inflation. Stop and think deeply. And Eugene Peterson in the message paraphrases it this way. Take a good, hard look at your life. Think it over. You've spent a lot of money, but you haven't much to show for it. There's a hole in the bucket, dear Liza, dear Liza. There's a hole in the bucket, dear Liza, a hole. That song was written during this day. (laughs) And I think what God is saying through Haggai is simply this. You have forgotten my promises. Didn't I tell you that I would never leave you and never forsake you? Like, go back and remember who I am and who you are. Remember my promises. If you honor me with the first and best, you will never lack. And why? Because I want to break the two greatest economic powers over your life. Fear and greed. Fear of running out, scarcity, and greed, never able to satisfy my desire for more. And so Haggai asks further question. When's it time to give to the Lord what's causing your financial anxiety? And then basically you want to fix it? Well, let's get to work. Verse 8, go up into the hills and bring wood. Build the house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. Let's fix this thing. I will be glorified. I will take pleasure in this house and in turn, I will take pleasure in you. And then we get a little bit of an echo. We get a recap in the next few verses. You looked for much and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore, the heavens above have withheld the dew. The earth has withheld its produce. And I've called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on what the ground brings forth on man and beast and on all their labors." You've looked for much, but what you did bring home, I blew it away. Very interesting that the Lord is basically saying, I have sent these lean days upon you to get your attention. The three primary staple income, the three primary staple crops, the grain, the wine, and the oil. You've expected a great harvest, but you're not getting it. And then finally, the last few verses, we see the revival response. Verse 12, Zerubbabel, and then Joshua, the remnant of the people obey the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God has sent him, and the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message, I am with you, declares the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the governor, and Judah, uh, the governor of Judah, the spirit of Joshua, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the month, in the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. Revival response. 
The people hear the word of the Lord and they fear the Lord. Now, that word fear is not the sense of terror I'm afraid of, but fear in the sense of awe, overwhelmed with awe at the goodness, the grace, the mercy of God, reminding themselves of who God was and who he is. He is powerful, he is good, he is mighty, and they stood in awe of him. Reminder from Deuteronomy 4, what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call on him? reminding themselves of who God is, and the Lord stirred their hearts, it says, which is the secret to revival, renewal. It is the Lord who stirs. It is the Spirit who stirs. And then people respond. Okay, so that's our story. And if you pull the plane back up now to the 30,000-foot view of Scripture and literally the 66 books of Scripture, we can be reminded that the greater story of the Bible, that there are so many principles regarding our finance. In fact, did you know that the Bible says more about money than any other topic except God himself? Did you know that? It has so much to say about how we earn, how we save, how we give, how we spend, how we invest, how we handle debt. It's all there in the scriptures. But most importantly, it reveals to us that God is intimately concerned for us and that he has promised to never forsake us. And he invites us to trust him in this and not only trust him, but that we can actually put him to the test in this. And there are literally hundreds of verses on this topic. We, we don't have time. Just a couple, Hebrews 13, keep your life free from the love of money. Be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's interesting that those are coupled together. Keep your life free from the love of money. Why? Because the Lord has said, I'll never leave you. I will never forsake you. You can take that to the bank so we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. It's an echo of what we have here in Haggai 1.13. The Lord saying, I am with you. I am with you. Now, I'm sure you've heard the statement that honoring the Lord with our finance is both a test and a trust. And there are two great enemies to our placing our trust in God's supply. They are fear and greed, or we might put them this way, the empty cupboard syndrome and the more toys syndrome. Fear and greed. The empty cupboard syndrome is the fear I'm going to run out. Fear that will drive me to hoard my stuff and hide from those who have need and maybe... Get angry if somebody suggests that I should give some of it away. It's mine. It's precious. <laughs> and I use that analogy on purpose because the Lord of the Rings metaphor, that's what that was supposed to be. And the ring of power that had overtaken Gollum promised beauty, power, provision. With me, you can rule the world. It's mine. It's precious. And it's the reason why in North America that we have this phrase, I'm sure you've heard it, we call it the almighty dollar. The almighty. Very interesting. Now there's a number of fallacies to that line of thought, of course, and most important is this. 1 Corinthians 4, what do you have that you did not receive? That's a very important question. And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? And so when it comes to money, when it comes to cash, it is amazing how easy it is for us to believe that we have done this. That somehow we are so smart, we are so strong, we are so intellectual, and yet the scriptures make it very, very clear that you would not earn a dime without the sovereign blessing of God over your life, right? You wouldn't earn the first penny. In fact, you wouldn't take your next breath if it were not for the sovereign hand of God. And so you think you're so smart. Where did you get your brains? You think you're so strong. Where did you get that strength from? Whether it is brains or brawn, it all comes from God. Deuteronomy 8 says, Beware lest you say in your heart, My power and my hand has gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth. The Lord is the one who made you able to earn your income. 
And so I don't need to say much about the second, the more toys syndrome. We live in this sea. It's the air we breathe. We live in a world that is driven along by bigger and better, faster and shinier, new and improved. I'm sure you've seen the bumper sticker. He who dies with the most toys wins, right? Years ago, funny uh, comment from an author who was decrying the title of a magazine. Did you ever see the magazine, Better Homes and Gardens? And he's asking the question, better than who? Better homes and gardens than what? Better than your home. Better than your garden. Just look at what others have been able to do that you don't have. Look and weep and then jump on the train and just try to keep up with the Jansons. Luke 12, Jesus would say, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. He goes on to comfort them. Jesus, saying, I know what you need. Don't be anxious about your life, what you'll eat, or about your body, what you'll put on. All the nations of the world seek after these things. Your father knows you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom. And these things will be added unto you. So in a culture that is steeped and driven along by greed, we've got to think about these things. So J.D. Rockefeller, Rockefeller was the world's first billionaire, like 100 years ago, long before there were many, many billionaires. And he was once asked the question, how much is enough? And he answered almost immediately, just a little more. Just a little more. And our lives are flooded with displays of great wealth and insatiable drive for more. You can have it all. You just got to work a little harder. And Psalm 49 would say, don't be afraid. And the word they're afraid is don't be overawed. Don't look with, you know, awestruck eyes and wonders when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his house increases. For when he dies, he'll carry nothing away and his glory will not go down after him. And so the empty cupboard syndrome or the more toy syndrome can hold us hostage. And Jesus said it, that we can't serve both God and money. And so we need to be honest. Uh, We in this room need to be honest that we live in the wealthiest generation that has ever walked the planet. And we also live in the wealthiest part of the world. We, uh, listening to this message, are the world's 1%. Uh, I've said this to you many times before. This year on your tax return, if you had more than $10,000 in your income, you earned more last year than 80% of the world's population. And if you happen to have had more than $50,000 on your tax return, you earned more than 99% of the world's population. We are the 1%. Is that not amazing? So we need to thank God for that and be very, very aware. We need to pray that God would open our hearts and minds of the people around us as we look to uh, building programs and ministries to take the gospel uh, to our city, as we plant churches, as we look to the spiritual needs of the nations, are we also willing to trust him for every need? Because these people, in essence, were saying, right now is not a convenient time. It's not the the time for me to be giving, or we can't afford to give. Uh, We've got holes in our pockets, and So I can't afford to give. And and as I say that, I was reminded this week of a funny story from like, it's got to be 30 years ago. I don't know if any of you remember the name of Richard Halverson, but he was the chaplain to the U.S. Senate. Not a role that most people know about, but this guy was sort of an outgoing, uh, charismatic type personality. He was a Presbyterian pastor, and he spoke at a lot of events. And I remember, I was probably in college, him telling the story of in Washington, D.C., he's meeting with this young lawyer, and the lawyer's like, Pastor Halverson, can you pray for me? I've got a problem. He says, great, let's talk. He says, you know what? Back in the day when I was just clerking and I was you know, a law clerk and I was lobbying in the, the halls of power here in Washington and living in a one-bedroom bachelor suite and earning just $30,000 a year, like my parents taught me to tithe and so it was easy back in the day. 3,000 bucks off the top, I tithe, I gave, but I gotta be honest with you. The years have gone by, I've gotten married, we're living in a big house, I'm in practice now and I'll just be very honest with you. This year I brought home $300,000. And if I tithe off that, that is $30,000, and I literally cannot afford to tithe. Can you help me? And the pastor said, I'm not sure I can help you, but what I can do is I can pray for you. That's great. And as Halverson tells the story, they got down on their knees in his office, and Halverson prayed like this, Lord, you have heard my brother's story. You have heard his deep desire 
that he wants to honor you with his wealth, but he simply cannot afford to honor you. So I'm asking you that you would reduce his income back to the place <laughs> where he can afford to tithe once again. Now that, of course, was not what that young man expected. And someone is probably asking the question right now, so what, are we supposed to feel guilty for everything that we have? No, absolutely not, because every good gift comes down from the Father of lights. But we need to remember that it has indeed come down from him. Every gift is from him. It's why we continue to pray for our daily bread, right? Why do you give thanks when the cupboard is full and when the deep freeze is full and when the second fridge in the garage is full? And if, if you run out of food, Costco's got lots more. Why do you give thanks for your daily bread? To remind yourself that even your daily bread comes from the hand of God. And so the countercultural, intuitive response of the kingdom of God, you want to break the power of greed and fear? The easiest thing is to give it away. So Wesley was a great preacher, and he actually had the ability to make a lot of money. He was a popular itinerant speaker, and particularly as he began to write books, and those books were selling, and he made a decision early on that he would give away all the proceeds from those books. And he made this statement, and he said, money never stays with me. It would burn me if it did. I throw it out of my hands as soon as possible, lest it should find its way into my heart. Now, now, Wesley was not against money, and he did a lot of teaching on money, and he had three principles that he was famous for telling people what to do with their money. Earn all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. There's a very good sermon outline right there. So when God sets to renew his people, he resets their financial priorities. And it's a massive topic. It's all over the Bible. And I think there can be uh, no other reason for that then simply that money is the number one idol, the number one rival God to God himself. There's no other substance that takes on such godlike power over our lives. And we might ask the question, why does money talk make people nervous when it shouldn't? Every single one of us needs money for our daily lives, and God provides everything that we need. Uh, one of my very first jobs, young teenager, 13, 14, working for a janitorial company. And an old, crusty World War II vet named Ray Hulick was my boss. And he talked a lot, and he had a lot of cheesy jokes, and he, he talked about money a bit, and he would say things like, it ain't a sin to be poor, it's just awfully inconvenient. And then many, many times, in fact, I think almost every week, he would say to me, Mark, never marry for money. But where there's money, look for love. <laughs> Didn't work for either Carolyn and me. And in the day that we live in, we cannot be fearful to speak the Bible's countercultural sexual ethic. That was last weekend, right? And nor should we shy away from digging deep into what the Bible says about money. And so let's wrap it up. How does our view of money change in times of revival? How do we fix our fear? How do we fix our greed? We get our eyes on Jesus again. You're like, well, remind me of that. Well, 1 Peter says, you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with precious blood. With the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Romans 8, who will he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us, how will he not with him also graciously give us all Things. And then a couple verses later, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And then look at the list. Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, economic issues, nakedness, danger, or sword? Nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. 1 Corinthians 6, you're not your own. You were bought with a price. Uh, Heidelberg Catechism, question number one. What is your great comfort in life and death? That I'm not my own. I belong to him. He bought me. I'm not my own. And I don't think Haggai actually would be a very popular speaker today. He's not seeker sensitive. He is not politically correct. He asks tough questions and he lays down big challenges, but he calls us back to the gospel. Don't forget the God who saved you. And the principle is this, the closer you get to Jesus, the more generous your life will become. I thank God for the generosity of his people. We have watched it for decades. I thank you for the generosity of Northview. 
Overall, is filled with a ton of faithful and generous givers, and, and your faithfulness is letting us plant churches and train leaders and reach out in Abbotsford and Mission. But I also know the flip side is true for some, and maybe in this crowd, that you've not yet learned the joy of trusting God with every area of your life. Specifically, you've not stepped into the freedom of letting Jesus run your finances. And if you're here today and you find yourself relating to either those great barriers, the empty cupboard syndrome or the more toys syndrome, fear or greed, scarcity or covetousness, can I invite you to consider your life soberly? Uh, One good book, I could recommend a, a ton of them, but one really great little book, it's under 100 pages long. I don't think it has pictures, but it's short. Randy Alcorn's book, The Treasure Principle. If you want one good book on this topic, I would encourage you to read that. From cover to cover, the Bible is filled with the good news of the gospel. That God has done everything that needs to be done to purchase our salvation. We don't merit our salvation. It's a free gift. And by all of that, we should simply say to this, if I can trust him for my eternal salvation, then surely I can trust him to meet my daily needs. And there might be no more tangible work of the Spirit of God in renewal and revival than when the Spirit of God frees us up from the rat race of the bigger, better, shinier, faster, new, and improved. And when God releases generosity in his children. When God sets to renew his people, he resets their financial priorities. So stand with me. I want to pray for you. Lord Jesus, thank you that you care about the very practical details of our life. It's been a few weeks of hard-hitting stuff. Last weekend, as we talked about our marriages and our families and our sexuality, we know that that is so real in our day-to-day lives, and you touch on all of those areas for us. And then, Lord, we turn and we look at our financial needs, and we look to you, our loving and gracious Heavenly Father, and we say, you know what? We wouldn't have anything if it didn't come from you that all of these blessings, and so Father, I wanna just on behalf of our congregation say thank you for your blessings. Thank you for the part of the world that we live in and we often complain about all the problems that Canada has, but on the flip side, it is a wonderful place to call home. And we are so richly blessed. And so Father, would you make us content people? Would you make us generous people? And Father, specifically, I wanna pray for those two groups of people. If there's somebody here who is bound up in fear, scarcity, fear of running out, the empty cupboard, would you free them? Would you let them see that you're with them, that you've promised to never leave and never forsake? And then, Father, for all of us, because of the culture that we live in, it is inundating us every day that we need more stuff and better stuff and new stuff. And so, Lord, free us from the tendency towards greed that is inside every one of us. May we honor you Thank you for your gift of salvation, and thank you for your gift of provision. In Jesus' name, amen.